Hello, everyone. This is Pastor Brent. I uh, just want to thank you for tuning in uh, for this past Sunday's sermon. If you are watching on our app or through our website, or if you're listening through wherever you catch your podcasts, we're so happy that you're tuning in with us today. Uh, we just want to invite you uh, to take a couple minutes and fill out a Connect card, or if you want to give um, financially and partner with our ministry, right now is your opportunity to do that through the links below or the buttons below this video. Uh, we're going to start the sermon here in a couple minutes, but I just wanted to personally say thank you for tuning in. Thank you for partnering with us. We love you guys, and uh, we just pray that this message blesses you. We'll see you in a couple minutes. Isn't God so good this morning? I, uh, I'm changing the plans. I'm going to go right into my message. So if you want to take your seats for a second and uh, give it up for the worship team. They're going to be back up here in a minute. Uh, I pretty much pull an audible on a regular basis around here. And uh, I just am too excited. I'm excited to get in uh, to what God has for us this morning. And... Uh, so I asked Zach if he could host at the end. Uh, if you're an early exeter, uh, make sure you fill out a Connect card. If you want to give, you can drop it in the bucket. You can do it on the app, but Zach will give you all that at the end. Uh, I know some of y'all get hungry, you know. You know, you're like half hours too long, right? <laughs> and, uh, but but we're gonna, I'm going to believe everyone's going to stay today uh, because I think God is ready to do something. And I'm, I'm really excited. So we're going to have some worship time um, at the end. But if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke chapter 5, verse 17. That is where we are going to be today. We have been in this series called I See a Victory. And this, the, the basis behind this series is um, what, is God de- what has God given us to declare over our lives? Rather than declaring defeat and oppression and what's against us, Um, I believe God has established some things that we can declare as truths, as foundations, specifically Jesus in in some specific capacities that I've been working through. So so Jesus came to establish some things, and we we started off as Jesus is our Savior. He saves us. He rescues us. And then last week, uh, we talked about Jesus sanctifying us, bringing us toward holiness, right? Like, how, how how do we walk in that? How do we declare that over our lives? And so this, uh, today we're going to continue that series, and we're going to work through some of these things because I believe these are things that uh, when you are in moments where you are struggling, where you are battling, um, God has already given you the tools to declare the victory in your life. And uh, I think far too often, specifically in this season of the church that we're in, uh, we are declaring defeat far, far more often than victory. And, and I believe uh, we need to take the, the, the victorious posture God has given us. And so Luke chapter 5 is where we're going to be, but every week there is a core verse, um, just a verse that we can grab a hold of, a verse that, that we can declare some things in our lives. And, and you don't have to turn there, but you can if you want. Um, Isaiah 54. And uh, some of y'all, if you've grown up around church, you've heard this, right? Your grandma said this to you uh, when, when, you know, you're walking through some times. And uh, Isaiah 54, verse 16, God is speaking. He is declaring some things. 
And uh, this, this is what he says. He says, I have created the blacksmith who fans the coals beneath the forge. He's, he's, he's very poetic in the book of Isaiah. He's speaking in some figurative imagery. And uh, he says, I created the blacksmith who forges the coals beneath the forge and makes the weapons of destruction. He's talking about the evil one, the enemy. I, I, I created him, and I have created the armies that will destroy. But this is the truth I want you to hold on to, verse 17 this morning. But in the coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. There is a powerful truth in this passage for our lives. And this morning, as, as, as we talk about this idea of, of Jesus as our healer, right? Like Jesus as our overcomer. What if we lived our lives with the level of authority that God is speaking in the book of Isaiah? I want you to think, about what if you lived your life? What if you woke up every day and maybe you verbally said, there is nothing that will come at me today that will defeat me. There is nothing that will prosper. I, there, there will be arrows. It doesn't say you won't get hit, right? It doesn't say there won't be things, the armies won't come against you, right? Sometimes we're like, I'm with Jesus. Nothing bad is going to happen. And then we get derailed, right? Things happen in our lives. But what if you really took that posture of there is no weapon that will destroy me. I am an overcomer. What if we took that posture that is written in the book of Isaiah? Anybody love cards? Anybody a cards player? You love cards? Uh, anybody love euchre? Come on. Where's my Midwest? We go, come on. We are having a euchre tournament at church. Let's go. We'll, we'll like bet money for missions or something. I don't know. Can you do that? I don't know the rules. But, uh, but come on, we're doing a Euchre tournament. I love Euchre. And uh, we, we have some Euchre champions here at Anchor. Uh, I have played some of you, and, and I won't say any names, and there are some people in this room that get real fiery during, they scare me. And uh, I mean, they're intense. And, uh, but, but I love Euchre. Some of you I've played Euchre with, and, and I will play you all day because I'll just smoke you in it. And, uh, but, but, but I love cards, and, and I love Euchre because uh, anyone ever gotten a loner in Euchre? There is a confidence that comes over you when you get a loner. And, like, man, you just take a whole, you're like, come on, you want to throw them. Anyone ever just thrown them all down on the table and said, come at me, Right? There is a boldness that comes forward. <laughs> you rise up. Like, you're like, I'm the Euchre champion of the world. Get me a gold bracelet. I don't know if they do that, but just poker. I, I, I love it. And I, and I love, man, I, I am the best winner and the worst loser. Anyone like that? Like, my wife will be like, I can tell when Brent's playing bad, he gets real grouchy. And that is 100% true. Because I am competitive. I hate to lose. I was a middle child. I, br I blame it on my upbringing. And uh, I want to win at everything. And if I'm losing, then I'm going to lose horribly. And uh, I'm, <laughs> yeah, never mind. And, uh, and so, so but, but, but there's, there's something if you've ever played Euchre or if you're a noob at Euchre, right? Uh, when, when you get cards, there's a difference between when you have that loner and you're confident where you're just flinging cards down. But there's nothing worse than having like a hand of nines and tens, right? It's the worst. And, so, yeah, and some of y'all play that rule where you get nines and tens, you throw it in. No, those are the hands you were dealt. You play them, <laughs> and uh, that's how we play. And uh, and so, and, but, but the, 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 what I'm getting to is there is a level of confidence when you're good, and then there's also a level of confidence when you don't have the when you don't feel you have good cards in your hand, right? Or you don't know what you're doing, or or if you've ever been taught, you some of you are like, I don't even know you. Or I tried to play it once. It was a stupid game. I don't understand why jacks change and all this stuff. But, like, the confidence level goes down, right? And you feel like, like you don't have the boldness. You're not throwing cards down like when you have a loner hand. And this morning, the, the reason I bring up Euchre is that I think often God has dealt us the cards we need. Like, we, the, they have been put in our hands. God has given us the cards we need, but we don't play with the authority that he has called us to. We play with hands, we play with the confidence of nines and tens when God's saying, I've given you, I've given you Trump over, I've given you all the jacks. You got jacks, aces, you got all the best cards in your hand. 
And we sit, and we sit in this posture with no authority, and we think everything is just going to defeat us and wear us down. And God is saying, I've already established myself in your life, right? Isaiah, when, when, when he's speaking this, when God is speaking, he says, these benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication comes from me. There is a boldness when you sit in the throne room of God, right? Like imagine, like we, we are in his throne room. We are his children. He's saying, there's no weapon. There's, I created them, right? He starts off this passage saying, I created the enemy. So there's nothing he can do that I'm not ready for. And you inherit that boldness, that confidence, right, by sitting in his presence. God has given you every card. We should just be throwing them down, saying, come on, come at me again. Come at me again. I might, I might lose a round, but I ain't going to lose the game. And so this morning as we talk about this, as we talk about this idea of nothing coming against you prospering, the boldness that comes, how do we sit in this position where we say Jesus is our healer, Jesus is our hope, Jesus is our overcomer, right? Because God sent Jesus down to establish these truths in our lives. So how do we take that posture of him being in that position? Specifically this morning, when, when I come to healing, I, I know people get kind of weird about it, right? When we talk about this idea. But if you read the Gospels, Jesus spent his whole, he was walking around healing people physically, mentally, emotionally. Everywhere he went, he was touching people's lives and healing them from their brokenness. And I wonder why in the church we get so under, uncomfortable, uncomfortable with the subject of healing, right? Like, oh, it's weird, like... It's going to get weird, like we're talking about healing. But I think there's some limitations that we've put in our lives that cause us some roadblocks that we've established that cause us to struggle with Jesus as our healer. We like Jesus as our Savior, like, come and save me. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. Save me from myself. We like Jesus as our sanctifier, right? The one making, like, make me holy. Like, let me in. But when we get to healing, we're like, ah. I don't know. It's kind of weird. Like, I don't want to air out my, my, my laundry. I don't, wanna, I don't really want to get into that place. And so specifically, why do we struggle with God as our overcomer when it comes to healing? I want to ask that question this morning. Real briefly, I'm not going to preach as long today. I say that very loosely. Everybody in the front row that laughs at me because I'll tell 1,200 stories and it'll be an hour later. Just kidding. Sticking to it today. You guys got to wake up, say something. Come on. So why do we struggle? This is the question I want to ask today. If you have your Bible, Luke chapter 5, I want to read a short story. Verse 17, Jesus is off healing people. Wapa! You know, just making moves, healing people all over the place. And uh, this scene happens and unfolds. And if yeah, some of y'all watched this cartoon version as a kid, I don't think they made a VeggieTales version. I don't know. I'm too old. But I remember watching it with, with kid, my kids. And so my kids love VeggieTales now. Lauren's throwing down some VeggieTales in the kids' wing, and it's awesome. I'm like, keep it going. Bob the tomato. Let's go. So Jesus is, is doing his ministries out, calling up the disciples. He had just called up the disciples, the, the, the chosen 12 that are going to follow him. And uh, there, there were, Jesus had a multitude of people, but he chose 12 specifically. And then out of the 12, there were three. And out of the three, there was one, right, Peter? And so there, there's a model for discipleship here that, that we will get into at some point, but not today. And uh, so Jesus is out calling up the disciples. And in verse 17, this is what it says. Follow along with me. If you have your Bible, this is church. Come on, people. Here we go. Anybody got a real Bible? Zach got a new Bible just for church with big letters. Come on. That's a sign you're getting old. Here we go. One day Jesus was teaching some Pharisees and teachers of the religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men had showed up from every village in all of Galilee, Galilee, Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. So all the religious leaders said, we're going to all get together and go check out who this man is. And so from all around they come together, they say, forget the peasants, we're going in. Right? They get there first, push them aside. 
real, real religious and all. So they get in and they, and they show up. They all come around. And the Lord's healing power was strong with Jesus. So, so right, like, let's just start right there. The, the healing power is specifically strong with Jesus. That's why people would touch the hem of his garments and be healed. If, we, if you read on um, throughout the book, that's why, that's why everywhere he went, he was touching people's lives. And so uh, it goes on to verse 18. Some men were car- carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. This is a man. You, you got to catch the details. Not a small child, a full-grown paralyzed man. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So there are so many people crammed in this house. What people believe this is the house of Peter, right? The the chosen one, right? They're in Peter's house. And so, so many of the Pharisees and religious leaders had crammed inside. I'm not kidding when I say peasants step aside. They were not welcome in. And so these men with this, these, these guys carrying this paralyzed man try to get in and they can't even get through the door. Obstacle one. Verse 19. They couldn't reach him because of the crowd, so they went up on the roof. You guys got to catch what's happening because the details matter in this story. So they try to go through the door. They say, we can't get through the door. So what do these guys do? They hoist their paralyzed friend. Dead weight, he ain't helping at all, laying on a mat. They tie him, I don't know, maybe they wrapped him in ropes and made a pulley system and hoisted him into the air. They get him up on the roof. They're like, this is the best idea we got. Not a window, not some, we're going up on the roof. And so it says they hoisted the man on the roof and they proceeded to take tiles. They start disassembling this house. Come, you guys read this stuff like you're so Christian. Like if someone showed up at your house and was like, I can't get in the front door, so I'm going to come and bust a hole in your roof, some of y'all would be angry, right? We're in Sylvania. You'd be calling the police when they step on your lawn. And uh, <laughs> bougie. And so, so they, they, start, they start cracking a hole in this guy's, in, in Peter's roof. Now imagine Peter's wife. She's freaking out like, Peter, you better get up there and do something. They're busting holes. The amount of work, like they try to go through the door, obstacle one. Now they have to get them onto the roof, obstacle three. Now what do you do once you're on the roof? We're going to start breaking holes, obstacle, wait, I think that's three. Three, I'm skipping numbers. There's a lot of obstacles. And so they start taking tiles off the roof. They lowered the sick man down on his mat. Like, so now we've hoisted him up. Now we're lowering him down. They're drop. Can you imagine Jesus teaching about something so holy? And he's teaching all these religious, like it's like seminary class in there. Like this, and all of a sudden, crack, ceiling opens up. Man just starts falling through. We couldn't get in, so we're dropping him down, Jesus. Like, come on, religious people. They're freaking out. So he says, they start dropping this man right down through the roof. Verse 19, right in front of Jesus. Verse 20, seeing their faith, seeing the effort these men go through, Jesus says to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. He doesn't even heal the man. He just looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. Welcome to the kingdom. He he didn't touch him, and the man stood up and started doing jumping jacks. He forgives him because Jesus is the Son of God. Sometimes we jump straight to the healing. We want to get to the result, but we don't want to walk through the process. See, this man, the healing is a result of who Jesus is, right? It's it's proof of his divinity, right? Healing is what, what, what we receive because of who he is. And so he forgives this man of his sins, Verse 21, then the, then the religious people start rising up, right? Like imagine in church, there'd be some of us like, how unholy for you to break a hole in the roof of the house of God, right? I was a youth pastor for 15 years and we'd have like unchurched kids running through the church. Noah sitting up here was in my youth group. And I remember one, <laughs> we're in the church, he's skateboarding and trying to hop tables, Man, there are some old people that would have came in. No offense to old people. But, man, I had to fight some battles because of young Noah. Like, you would let them skateboard in the house of the Lord? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> like, like, this is, this is the, the posture of these Pharisees. They're like, 
How unholy, how undignified. And so then they start busting in on Jesus. They're like, they rise up and they say to themselves, who does this man think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Like they're, they're angry now, like holes, forgiven people. What the heck? Jesus in his calmness, because he's Jesus, right? He's not like us. He, he looks at them, and in verse 22, it says, Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he began to ask questions. Jesus is a smart guy, right? He was a son of a carpenter, but a genius. And uh, he starts asking questions. Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven, or is it easier to say stand up and walk? Verse 24, this is why I say healing is the result of Jesus' divinity, right? This is the proof of who Jesus is. Je Jesus says, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority. Remember we, in Isaiah, the authority that God gives us. The Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man, hole in the roof, friends looking down, Everyone around angry. Jesus turns to the man and he says, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. Now, this is not the only time Jesus says this in the scriptures. He also says it to another man around the pool of Bethesda. He says, pick up your mat. Like, don't leave it there because we're going to keep this house clean. Pick up your mat. Right? Clean up after yourself and get moving. Like, get them legs working. Let's go. He says, pick up your mat and walk out of here. Immediately, everyone who watched the man jump up. He didn't stand up. Man, if you were paralyzed, you'd be jumping up. I don't know what rose up in him, the confidence that happened. This man, I imagine he like did some you know, cartwheels, somersaults, backflip, I don't know. Jumps up, gets super hyped, picks up his mat, and he goes home praising God. Like, Man, he was shouting down the streets. Woo! I'm walking! He's the moonwalking in Jerusalem time, right? Like, come on, get at me, Michael Jackson. And so everyone, everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe. And they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. I want you to catch the course of events that happen, right? There's, there's some things that happen, and I believe this story lays out perfectly why we struggle with healing, because, because we don't know how to get from blocked at the door to cartwheels down the street singing. Like, we don't, we don't understand that process. We struggle with it. And I believe there's two specific reasons why in your life you struggle with the concept of healing. And the first thing is, is we don't trust Jesus' ability to do what we're asking. It's the posture of the Pharisees in the room. It's the posture of the religious leaders, right? Like, they, they, they believed enough to come and listen to him or to at least question him. They were interested enough. But they didn't quite believe he had the ability, right, as, as this man who said he was the son of God. We struggle with the idea that, like, Jesus can really heal people, right? He can really change our lives. He can really cleanse our mind. He can really give us breakthrough to overcome, and so in verse 21, when the Pharisees rise up and they say, who does he think he is? This is blasphemy. How, how, how can, only God can heal us. Not, not Je Jesus isn't our healer. Only God. And we have to go sacrifice and do all these things. And, and Jesus says, no, I came to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. I came to do what I Isaiah is talking about, right? I came so that you can be an overcomer in this world. And we struggle because we, we question the ability of the Son of God. And I think most of us in our lives have been at that place where we say, can God really do what I'm asking? And so we begin to declare defeat. Ah, God will never heal me of this. God, will, I remember as a kid, I've had bad eyes my whole life. Uh, some of you are like... Uh, and, and even at the point I got LASIK, and my eyes are so bad that I still wear glasses after having LASIK. And I remember as a kid praying at the altar. Like, I go to church, we were Pentecostal, down at the altar, and I'd be like, God, make me see. And I'd be like, 
<laughs> like, right? Like, I'm ripping the glass, and I'm like, I was serious, though. Like, I'd be like, come on. Like, I, I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. I did it all the time. I would lay in bed at night, and I'd be like, God, make me see, make me see, make me see. <laughs> and I would pray and pray and pray. But, I, but there, if I'm being honest, there was always this piece of doubt in me that was like, yeah, he's not going to heal my eyes. Like, he's healing people who can't walk. Like, I have glasses. I doubted it. And I think sometimes we, we miss our breakthrough because we, we can't even get over the hurdle that Jesus has the ability to. We don't believe the words of Isaiah that says, God is our overcomer, right? Nothing formed against you will prosper. No sickness, no disease, no mental, no mental uh, brokenness, right? No fear. Nothing will prosper. And so we're like, ah, I'm, I'm already defeated. And we throw in the towel. And just like these religious leaders that say, he, he has no authority, Jesus has to step in and say, is it easier for me just to heal him or to forgive him of his sins? He says, well, I'll just show you it all, right? Like, I'll heal him and I'll forgive him of his sins. It's interesting that we, we are more comfortable with the idea of God forgiving our sins rather than physically healing us. Because we like that. There, there's, no, there, there's, there's no risk in that, right? Like, oh, God just forgave me of my sins. Like, I'm good. And so we have to get through the hurdle of Jesus' ability. You have to understand who Jesus is, why he established himself. He is the son of God that, that, that took human form, that came down to walk as you and me, to walk this earth, to establish who God is, to heal the blind, to heal the broken, to forgive people's sins, to die on a cross so that now through the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to walk in the power of heaven daily. It's who God has called us to be. It's who Jesus is. But, but it's not just enough to believe he can heal. The, sex, the second obstacle, and I think the biggest thing that we struggle with, if we're being honest, when we're talking about healing, is we can't get past our personal limitations. There is a reason I pointed out the obstacles in this story. Because if most of us are being honest, we're okay with Jesus as our healer. We believe it, right? Like, Veggie Tales told me so, I'm in. But when we hit that blocked door where they say there's no room, most of us would have said, hey, buddy, sorry, we'll take you home. And even if we got past the door and we got up on the roof, most of us would get to that point and say, well, we tried to get up here, but there's no way in. Most of us wouldn't go through the effort of busting a hole to lower. And so we, we, we'd give up and say, God, God must not want you healed today, right? That, that's how they believed in that time is that God was punishing you, right? If you were paralyzed, it was because of the sins of your fathers or something. God, God wanted you to be paralyzed. And so we'd say, God must not want you. And then, and then we'd get the hole in and say, ah, now we got to lower them down. And, and, and when we get through all these limitations and roadblocks, and we miss our breakthrough, because we don't think, we, we, we think that, that we, we will never get through verse 18 of this. It said they dropped him down, they removed the tiles. And, and, and what does Jesus do right in front of all of these teachers as they drop him down in the room? Jesus says, seeing their faith. Seeing their faith is what leads Jesus to the moment of healing. He heals this man's soul first. Seeing their belief, getting through the limitations, and how often we, we hit those moments of oppression and we want to give up. And so... We say, God, just, he must not do that anymore, right? Like, that was just Jesus in the Bible. I think some of you in this room today, I'm going to get in your wheelhouse a little bit. I don't, I'm not always, I mean, I am always like this, but not as much. But I think some of you today are carrying some things, are struggling through some things. And, and, and you, can, you full believe Jesus can do it, but you've given up 
on seeking the healing that he's willing to give because you've hit some roadblocks in your life. You've hit some walls. There have been some limitations. You've, you've showed up at some doors that you expected to be open. Or you thought, you thought maybe you were like, like this man's friends. Man, they, they didn't show up at the door thinking like, oh, there won't be any room. They showed up at the door fully expecting to walk through and have a breakthrough. But if there's one thing I know about Jesus, if you read the Gospels, is he does not work on our time frame. Look at Mary and Martha when Lazarus dies. They call him. It takes Jesus three days to show up after his best friend had been sick. And when he shows up, Mary and Martha meet him out in the street, and they start to yell at the Son of God, right? Some of y'all are yelling at God right now, saying, you didn't show up when I asked you to. You didn't give me what I wanted. Band, if you ain't ready. You didn't didn't come through the way I expected you. I thought you were going to do this in my life. And and, and you're like these men at the door, and, and you're saying, God, I give up on you because you gave up on me. And God, God's saying, just because just because there's a roadblock doesn't mean I'm not moving. You gotta press in. You gotta push through. Jesus actually with Mary and Martha, they condemn him, and he's and he he kind of is like Psh. Do you, what? Do you know, I'm a son of God. Like, what? There's nothing, no limitation. And he walks up and he even weeps and cries because his friend's dead. And what's he do? He opens the grave and he says, Come out of there, Lazarus. And they're like, Oh, it's been too long. He's going to be stinky. What are you doing? He's like, Get up and walk. And, and Lazarus hops. Like, Come on. It's what the Bible, you guys got to read your Bible because it's funny. Said they had to cut the garments off to him after, after he came out. Three days later, what if they would have given up on day one? Jesus, don't come. We don't need you. He's dead. What if the men would have given up at the door when there was no room? What if when they got on the roof and there was no way in, they said, Psh, We're done. Church, this is the posture we take when the outcome doesn't meet our expectations, when the breakthrough doesn't happen how we want, when we expected one thing and the reality is different, we throw in the towel and say, Jesus has no ability to be my overcomer. And Jesus is saying, I'm ready for your breakthrough. Press in. I'm ready to heal you. I want to see you through this. But church, let me tell you when we're talking healing, if someone told you God is going to give you exactly what you asked for, exactly how you want it, when you want it, God can, he may. My experience, it's usually not how I want things. It's usually not in my time frame. It's usually not what I wanted it to look like. But when I humble myself, When I say, God, I'm going to seek you, whether or not it happens, I'm going to cut a hole in the roof if I have to, I'm going to get into your presence, and I don't know what the outcome, when they dropped their friend into the middle of that house, they didn't know what was going to happen. Jesus could have condemned them. How could you do this to this man's house? They didn't know, but their faith said, I'm pressing forward. My son, he's eight years old. Nine years ago, 10 years ago, if I can do math right in my head, Lauren and I made the decision we wanted a kid. And so we spent a year trying to get pregnant. For a year, we tried and tried and tried and tried. And, and I remember um, Lauren is a good mom. That's why she's our kids' pastor, because she's. She's just got that ability. She loves people. She cares for people. Like, like I'm, she calls me a robot, and she is not. She feels everything. And, uh, and so she's a good, she had this desire for motherhood. And for a year, we tried to get pregnant, and it was so bad, she couldn't get pregnant. And uh, she actually started to get ulcers in her, in her stomach because she was so stressed out. She thought, something's wrong with me. I'm never going to have children. I'm broken. And, and like would, would weep at night and cry and, and I didn't know how to help her. I'm like we just gotta, like when God's ready, when God's ready. 
And I remember we went to a youth camp because I was a youth pastor at the time. And a guy named Greg Ford, who actually was a youth pastor in Toledo, good friend of mine for a long time at Calvary Assembly down in Maumee. Uh, we, we paid him to come in before he planted his church and uh, said, Greg, will you come and preach at it? And we were, we were having altar time for the students, right? And, and I remember for some reason he went and was talking to Lauren and she began to tell him, and Greg just began to ask the question, what if, what, if the time, what if it doesn't look like how you wanted? What if the gift of motherhood isn't what you thought it was going to be like? What if, what if God has a different plan for you and you'll still be a mother, but it's not how you thought it would be? And he prayed for her and there was a peace that came over her in that moment. And so we kept walking and believing and she even, I never knew about it until like a year and a half later, but she had actually talked to a doctor to maybe still... She, she was trusting God, but she was still walking forward, right? And like, we're going to keep believing. We're going to keep believing. And we were sitting in a church service like this on a Sunday morning in Cleveland. And uh, I'm being real youth pastory with all my youth kids around me. And uh, there's this evangelist that was in, this, this missionary. And he's talking and he says, he's standing up front. And he says, I believe there's, there's three families in this room that are trying to have a kid. And they can't do it. God's telling me there is. And uh, I heard him, but, but I'm a pastor of the church, so I'm always like, I'm going to sit back. Like, maybe it's someone else. And so two families go up, and he said, there's another family in here. Like, I don't want you to miss this moment. And I remember sitting there thinking, like, nope, not going up, God. I taken the, I literally sat back in my seat and was like, nope, it's not for me. Like, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. And God's like, you got to press in. You got to press in. And finally, one of my students' dads who knew what was going on, a guy named Dean Poor, love him. Uh, and uh, he turns around and he slaps me. I'm like, dude, don't, we're in church. I'm very Pharisee right now. I'm like, don't, don't, I'm, we will get, I'll take my earrings out. Let's go. And uh, he smacks me and was like, dude, what are you doing? Go. And I'm like, no, I'm not. It's for someone else. And he starts, he's like, dude, you better get up and you better take your wife and go forward. And so we, I was like, fine. And I had a bad attitude. Like, right? Like, I'm not like this guy's friends with good faith. I have bad faith. I'm like, fine. I'm going, but I ain't happy about it. I drag Lauren up front. We're standing there. So this guy starts praying and he lays hands on us. He starts praying. And all of a sudden, like something, I'm telling when the Holy Spirit hits, like it don't matter. Full grown man, I, I just start crying. Lauren's crying. I'm snotting in front of the church. I'm supposed to be all holy and believing, and I'm angry and crying. And he's like, God's gonna give you a kid. Let me tell you, uh, two of the couples, the third couple, there's a whole story there, and there's a reason they didn't get pregnant. But the, the, us and another couple at the church got pregnant almost to the day at the same time. Almost to the day. Our kids are almost exactly the same age. And, and we walked out of that service. And let me tell you, I look at my son, and, and there is a testimony of faith in his life. That if I would have sat in that seat, if I would, I, I, maybe God would have came through another way, but maybe, maybe I wouldn't have received the blessing right then when I have it, right? He, I, I'm sure God would have blessed me at another time, but it only took me walking through, believing, taking a step of faith, getting out of my seat, naming what I was angry about, naming what I was disappointing about. Church, there is power when you name it. We don't like to name things because it makes us uncomfortable. But when you come to that altar, when you get in that place and you say, God, this is what I want. This is what I need breakthrough. There is power. You are declaring a victory over that. My son is a testimony. We thought we were going to have kids right away. We thought it was going to just happen. Church, the timeline doesn't always look like what you want, but the blessing is still the same if you walk in faith. Jesus is ready to move. And some of you in this room have been carrying things. Maybe it's physical. Maybe you gave up asking. 
Maybe it's mental. Maybe you've had some struggles. Maybe you have some, some things that are holding you down, some things that are holding you back. And, and you just need to, you need to name it today and say, God, I need healed to this. I, I need the power of Jesus to come over me and cleanse my mind. I need breakthrough from this. I need cleansing from this. I need the power of heaven to open up in this place. Church, do not miss it. Don't run out the door. I know you got places to be. I know you got somewhere to go. But you know what? Chipotle will still be there when church ends. Your appointment, they can wait. This moment is too important. So if everybody can stand real quick. I've only done this probably three times in the history of our church. And I, I always say, I'm not trying to make anyone feel uncomfortable, but I don't want you to miss your moment. I don't want you to take the posture of sitting back and saying, it just isn't going to happen. It's someone else's time. Today is your time. God has already declared victory in your life. Whatever you think has defeated you, God has already, God has already declared victory over that, that, that battle, that oppression, that de the depression in your head, the fear in your head, that physical breakthrough that you need. God has already declared a victory. And, and I'm not promising you'll come forward and it'll be easy. It might be a process like these guys in the book of Luke. Where you just need to get one, through one, one obstacle today. And then the next obstacle. And every, every time you get through one, you're closer to that breakthrough. I don't know what it is, but, but I, I, I know there are some of you in this room. Some of you are angry. Some of you are holding on to some anger. I, I feel it. I know it. Some of you are hurt from church. Some of you are mad at God. Because you thought your life would be different, it would look different, and, and it's been a struggle. There is some anger in this room. God's ready to heal you today. God's ready to release that in your life. Some of y'all need to lay some wounds down in this, at this altar and give it to the Lord. Some of y'all physically, you need a breakthrough. And so I asked, uh, I asked some of our leadership team and our elder team, uh, if you want, they are going to be available for prayer this morning. I believe there is a power to action. You can sit in your seat and God can move. But I believe when you take that step, when you get out of your seat, if you come forward, I know it's COVID-19, wear your mask, be careful, whatever you need to do. But you know what? God is bigger than a virus. God is bigger than a sickness. Your moment of breakthrough is more important than any fear or anything in this place. Some of y'all need prayer this morning and you need to name it. You need someone to lay hands on you and to speak over your life and declare the victory that God has given you this morning. I don't know who it is, but some of you are angry and you just need, you need God to break that off of you, to heal your heart, to heal your mind this morning, right now. And so I'm going to pray and then we're going to open up the front. If you want prayer, come forward. If you want to stay in your seat and worship, stay in your seat and worship. Hang in this moment. If, if, if someone's up here, pray for them from your seat. Pray for them where you're at. Let's, let's enter into the presence of God this morning and let's believe that, that, that one, he is our healer. He, he is ready to, he, he came to heal our souls. He came to heal our lives. He came to move. He is still moving today. The Bible says the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the, it did not cease when this book was written. God did not stop moving. I believe our faith has become weak. Some of y'all need to come forward. And so I asked some of the guys in our leadership team and they're available. And I encourage you to name what you need this morning. Declare victory over it. Don't be ashamed. If, if, if you're angry, name it. I'm mad at God. We're gonna pray for a breakthrough today. If you need physical healing, name it. We're gonna pray for a breakthrough today. If you need peace, name it. We're going to pray for a breakthrough today. 
And so I'm going to pray, and when I say amen, if you want to come forward, come forward. Find a spot. If you want prayer, there'll be a a couple guys over here and a couple over here. We'll get prayer going this morning. But, But let's have a moment. Let's get in the presence of God. I believe he's ready to move in this place. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you. God, you are a good God. You are a present God. You're ready to move in this place. God, I pray that we would take steps of faith, just like the friends of this man in the book of Luke. God, their their faith, they saw through the obstacle. They believed Jesus was who he said he is. Let us take the steps to believe for a breakthrough this morning. You're not waiting for tomorrow. This isn't someone else's moment. This is, this is your moment in this place. God is ready to move. You are not here by accident today. You are ready to move. And so God, as we press in, as we believe, as, as we ask for more of you, as we ask for more of your presence, God, I pray that that you would flow through this place, that the Spirit of God would fall on this room, that lives would be transformed, that minds would be transformed, that physically people would be transformed in this place. And we believe it and we declare it in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you want prayer, come forward.